Welcome to the Hybrid Real Estate Professional Podcast, where we dive deep into the intersection of career, family, and finances. Learn the mindsets, tips, and strategies to help you on your personal journey to build a life of abundance and purpose for you and your family. Now, here's your host, Karen. Amin. Welcome back to another episode of the Hybrid Real Estate Professional Podcast. Today, I'm joined by fellow entrepreneur and real estate investor, Randy Smith. Randy is the founder of Impact Equity, which was formed to help investors achieve strong results in their passive real estate investing strategies. Randy and Impact Equity have helped more than 100 investors place over $7.3 million across three operators and 15 different opportunities since he launched in June of 2022. Randy started his real estate investing career doing out-of-state, single-family, long-term rentals, and he quickly realized the many additional benefits he could receive by switching his strategy to passive investing in multifamily syndication. Randy now has invested in 25 different deals with 11 different operators, which gives him the unique knowledge and expertise to recognize a strong passive opportunity. He currently lives in Peoria, Arizona with his wife, Jenny, and he spent 25 years working in various business development and leadership roles in corporate America. Can't wait for you to hear the interview. Well, let's get into it. All right. Today, I have a special guest, Mr. Randy Smith. Randy and I have known each other for, what, about seven, eight months now. And full transparency, I even invested in a couple of deals with Randy. Happy to have you here, Randy, and would love for you to just introduce yourself to the audience in your own words. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you so much for having me on the show. It's always an honor and a privilege to, to get to jump on somebody else's stage. So I appreciate your trust in doing so. And also, your trust in partnering with me on those opportunities. Yeah. So as you mentioned, I was in corporate America for about 25 years. I worked primarily for two different Fortune 100 or Fortune 200 companies for the very large majority of that 25 years. And I was a sales guy. I was out carrying the bag. I was in the field. I managed phone sales teams and uh, actually ran some pretty large groups of salespeople through both of those organizations. And about five years before I left the W-2 world, I started investing in real estate in single family out of state and then shifted pretty abruptly over to passive investing. And since leaving the W-2, I have helped other people on their passive investing journey with impact equity. Awesome. I love to go through that chronologically because there's a ton there. And the kind of theme of this show, the hybrid real estate professional, is someone who leverages skills, experience, money, connections, whatever it may be from previous portions of their life, usually their career, and then uses that to become a, a real estate investor. And so obviously yep. you pretty much check that box pretty thoroughly with starting in the corporate world and then pivoting towards full-time real estate. So you mentioned you were yeah. in sales, very kind of frontline, customer facing, dealing with people a lot. Were, were those sales skills, what got you interested in the line of work you're in now, like with capital raising, or how did that lead to real estate? Yeah, yeah. And I think that's a really good question for, for the listener to really dig into their experience and their expertise toolbox that they bring with them because of their years in corporate America. And very clearly, sales background ties very nicely with capital raising or capital allocation, as we call it. So certainly sales skills have helped with that just simply because it's, it is, it is a contact sport. It is an activity sport. And just it, the more people you end up talking to and sharing your message and sharing the possibilities that come with passive investing, then the higher the likelihood you're going to see success. So certainly all of those years dealing with the systems and tools that are related with sales and, and the relationship building. And kind of project management as well ties very nicely to what I'm doing today. Yeah, definitely. See, I'm more of the operations and systems guy. I, I work in consulting now. Previously, I was in concert production. And so I was behind the scenes very much like, how do I get from point A to point B? And so it's yep. two sides of the coin, right? Like you need the sales skills. You need the out front ability to connect with people and build rapport. And then you also need that kind of integrator operators style. And so I find it interesting the different types of people that end up in real estate. But along mm -hmm. the way, you it's, it sounds like you started with uh, out-of-state, long-distance real estate or rental properties, which is exactly what I do. 
And so at what point in your career was that? And, and did you have any idea that passive investing existed when you made that initial decision to invest? Yeah, no, it's traditional real estate investing path generally starts with folks looking at what they know and people understand single family homes. They understand apartments. It's not too much of a stretch because most of us have lived in apartments at some point. But the easy answer was to take a look at a long-term hold single family rental because I felt like I knew it. It seemed like an easier entry place and it seemed like something you could do on the side and then potentially scale as well. And I, it, when I started with it, we have these different phases or different seasons within our career. And I had this trend where I would get promoted into a new role and it would be very heavy hours, lots of work. Like basically I didn't have any additional bandwidth when I would move into a new role. And then six to eight, nine months into it, then after you get the expertise in the role, you start to have some flexibility and autonomy in what you're doing if you're performing at a good level. And I had these different phases in my career where I'd get excited about real estate, but then I'd get a new promotion. So that would push it back to the back burner. And then I would stabilize again. I'd look at it again. And finally, at one point, I just pulled the trigger because um, I was sick of the roller coaster of the ups and the downs with it. And I was ready to start doing it. I knew real estate investing was going to be a part of my future. It was just a matter of when. And so glad that I did. I wish I would have started sooner, quite frankly. Yeah. So you're saying that kind of the rationale behind starting with a single family was it was a known product you knew and had seen thousands of other people. It's a common thing to get into rental real estate. And, and so you choose, chose the devil kind of situation. And that was, and then from there it evolved and you learned more and more about real estate, which then led you to your current path. Did I get that right? Yeah, there was a couple of, oh, a couple of distractions along the way we did. I think we, we ended up buying a total of six houses. We did the Burr, actually we started with turnkey model in Kansas City. Then we did the Burr model in Atlanta. Uh, I actually put some bids in on some 12 or 15 unit apartment complexes because I thought that was going to be the next step and found out very quickly I was getting out over my skis and was probably biting off more than I could choose. That's when I found the passive investing space, which really was attractive because you could get all of the benefits as if you're investing act actively, but you're betting on a jockey or working with an operator that's highly skilled and experienced and has the resources available. So essentially you just bring the dollars to the table, trust the operator with it and sit back and take advantage of all of the benefits as if you're operating. So. It was really a nice mix for us to get all of the benefits without having to get pulled away from the W-2. So do you feel like a large part of that boiled down to your capacity? Because hey, if I'm going to go buy a six or a 10 or 12 unit apartment building, I know it's going to require more time than if I bought a turnkey single family rental and I don't feel like I have that time. Was that a big driver in the decision? I, I think the reason I, I went passive versus going bigger with apartments was just the, the intimidation factor. I had made some mistakes in the single family space and uh, a, a mistake would that cost you $10,000 you can recover from pretty quickly. Uh, but a mistake that could cost you hundreds of thousands of dollars uh, is a little scary. So we went down that path instead. I was definitely not even considering taking on investor capital at the time. I'm one that likes to check, likes to test a model first before I share it with other people. So it was really the perfect mix of larger scalability and something that was less intimidating. And quite frankly, this was in the middle of COVID when I jumped into this and there just was not enough opportunity to keep growing my portfolio at the time because the market had just exploded and the numbers just weren't working on the deals that I was doing the underwriting on myself personally. It made much more sense to go larger and get the, the scalability of the larger units. No, I love that. Thank you for sharing that. I have a two-part question. One, if you're willing, can you share one example or, or even a couple of some of the mistakes that you made and what you learned from them? And two, what happened to those six single-family rentals? Do you still own them? Sure. So yeah, I'll share two that you'll notice there's a common theme here. But when I first bought those turnkey properties, the operator that I chose provided us with their, their due diligence 
checklist that they went through on this asset. And they're, I can't think of the word right now, but oh goodness, having a third party come in and essentially do due diligence on the asset. So he presented their due diligence checklist to me and suggested that I could get my own expert in there to do the same or just rely on theirs. And he seemed like such a nice guy and he had built such a large business that I trusted him. And as we bought these two assets and got just a little bit of time under our belt, we had some pretty, we had to replace a full roof within 60 days of buying it. We had to replace a HVAC unit. We had some terrible plumbing and drainage issues. So all of those things should have been caught on the front end, but I just did not do the due diligence that I should have. Uh, so like the message to the listener is definitely get your own inspections and trust those very closely or look at those very closely because there's a lot of information in there and quite often you can avoid very costly mistakes if you do that. So now fast forward about a year, we bought another house in Atlanta and it was a dog from day one. It was ugly. It certainly was the ugly house on the street. It looked like it should have been condemned. And my wife saw this property and she fell in love with it because she could see how beautiful it could become. And I'm not blaming her, but we decided to move forward in spite of inspections telling us, actually what we had on this situation was the realtor had inspected it. And then he had a third party foundation guy come in and the foundation expert said, there's chances that we might have to repair or replace a portion of the foundation. The realtor said he was exaggerating. So we moved forward and later we found out that it was a complete teardown and that almost cost us 50 or $75,000 because had we actually tore it down, rebuilt and sold in the middle of COVID, uh, we could have potentially sold at break even but it would have been two, two and a half year process. And more likely than not, we probably would have lost money on it. So we ended up selling that asset. I think we lost like $7,000. So in hindsight, that was very little compared to how bad it could have been with all the lost time and, and, and equity as well. So bottom line is get experts, trust experts, and do what the experts tell you to do. And you can save yourself a lot of heartache, I think. I love that. And thank you for sharing because I think people love to share wins and talk about how many units they have and how much cash flow they have. Not very many people are willing to share some of the mistakes. And sure. it feels when you explain that, it's some of it, it's, oh yeah, of course, get your own inspection and all that. But in the moment when you're talking to a reputable business owner who has a company that does this, uh, that's their product, like the turnkey yeah. provider you described, you want to be able to trust these people. And trust is actually a topic I want to really talk about with you because it parlays into your current line of work. But you sure. know, that there, there is an issue broadly in this industry. There are a lot of bad actors, unfortunately. And yep. you don't want to assume bad intent, but you do have to keep a guard up and definitely do your own due diligence. Yep. And I think one nice piece of silver lining there is you might have lost $7,000 on that house, but that lesson is worth a lot more than $7,000 and Absolutely. there's plenty of higher education that costs a lot more that you learn potentially even less from. Maybe if we paint it that way, it's not so bad. And yeah. There's, you... there's a, there's another personality in the space that calls them seminars. So I, that was my seminar. <laughs> I paid deeply for it, but not as bad as I certainly could have. So. Yeah. And so did you sell off? So you sold that one. Did you sell off the rest of the single families? I did. Actually, I sold all of the single families in. Oddly enough, it coincided with when I was leaving my W-2, I had them all listed and sold them all within 30 to 60 days of leaving my W-2, which just happened to be in June of 22, which was right at the top of the, so we, we sold at the perfect time, definitely. Right before the rates completely spiked, basically, right? Exactly. Exactly. Nice. Yes. That so. sounds like a nice sequence you had. You got to leave your job, which is inherently increases volatility, financial, emotional, all this stuff. And then you got some of that money back. And also you already knew pretty clearly what you wanted to do with that money. And, and you got all the experience along the way. So thank you for retracing kind of the journey that led you here. Now I want to spend some time on what is this industry you're a part of now? Um, sure. So passive investing, people hear that phrase thrown around a lot. 
first of all, there's a pretty big distinction, right? Investing in long distance, single family rentals of which you are the direct owner, you either have to manage yourself or have a property manager. That is not passive investing. Can we both agree on that? It absolutely. Yes. <laughs> okay. Underlined asterisks. Yes, definitely. Okay. So what exactly is passive investing by your definition then? Yeah. And I, so I think passive investing really is on a pendulum. And I've come to understand that even the passive investing that I am involved with very heavily is not as passive as a lot of people present it to be. Because by definition, a passive investment would be one where you invest, you sit back and you get mail, uh, mailbox money, and it takes no activity or action on your part whatsoever to get those returns. Now, what I am involved with today is the syndication model. We're essentially uh, generally a, a very large operator, varying sizes of operators, but an operator who's an expert in the field, who has a track record, who is, has the systems and tools and resources in place to manage the acquisition, the disposition, and then some type of business plan, whether it be value add or just simply stabilized investment. And the operator needs outside capital in addition to the bank in order to buy these assets and execute their business plan. So the passive investing that I'm involved with is connecting passive investors who most likely have high income W-2 jobs, and they need a place to place that capital to try to get better than market returns that they might get in the stock market. So this is a great way for high income folks to diversify their portfolio, participate to a certain degree on the due diligence piece on the front end, and then hand the reins over to the expert and let them take it from there. And hopefully they go out and execute their business plan, they meet their targets, and then you share in the upside on the back end as they sell or disposition those assets. And to confirm or just highlight one of the points you said, the only quote unquote work required of the investor is to do whatever due diligence they feel they need to do on the operator, or in your case, they would work with you as the, the capital raiser to really understand the deal and make sure they're comfortable with it. After which point there's no further work that they have to do, correct? That's correct. Yes. So due diligence on the operator and the deal on the front end, and then they're a hundred percent passive from that point. In fact, they cannot be active just simply according to the structure of the investments. They don't get a vote. They don't get a say. They don't even get to influence the, the direction of that business plan. It is entirely up to the operator at that point. And so we talked about how there's a lot of the same benefits, tax, the tax benefits, depreciation, appreciation, either natural or forced. Which of the types of benefits do you get as a single family investor that you do not get as a passive investor, if any? Yeah, good question. So I'm trying to think what, I, I can't think of any benefits you would get as a active investor that you wouldn't get as a passive, other than the fact that you get to be involved in the day-to-day -day, in the skill building and the experience of operating the unit. You, you certainly get appreciation, you get depreciation or tax benefits, and you get cash flow throughout the hold, depending on the type of passive investment that you're dealing with. So there's really not any benefits that you're getting as an active investor that you can't also get as a passive investor. And quite often, I would argue that the benefits are even better because as you buy larger assets, the tax benefits and the strategies associated with capturing those tax benefits get much larger just simply because of the size of the assets. I would argue that there is probably even better from a tax standpoint as a passive investor. Um, yeah. And I think that's really so, important. That's important to know because I think there's a misconception and part of it's the conflating of like when people talk about investing in real estate, some people, maybe they gravitate towards, okay, what's like a publicly traded REIT I can buy? REITs, yeah. they have some of the same tax benefits, but they don't have depreciation that flows through to your personal tax return. And right. they, you don't get this kind of same appreciation. You don't get to own the upside the same way. It's still 
functions yep. in a large uh, manner similarly to another stock. Whereas these passive investments, these syndications, you do get all those same benefits without any of the overhead administrative or, or just like emotional baggage that comes with this yep. stereotypical 3 a.m. toilet call type okay. living, living in your head. There are a couple of things though that I think are important to know. One on the REITs. REITs tie very closely to stock market returns as well. And there is this this emotional uh, aspect of the stock market where something can come out on CNN and next thing you know, the, the stock market's dropping. REITs tie very closely to the S&P in my experience and the research that I've done. Whereas real estate is generally, it might respond to what's going on in the economy. It's generally responding much slower and not as drastic as the stock market does. So I think it's a much more stable asset class to be involved with. And then tying back to your question earlier, one area where active real estate investors can benefit is their tax benefits can actually offset active income if they're able to get rep status, real estate professional status. Whereas if you're a passive investor, you would still need to have or be able to check the box that would allow you to get rep status. So of course, neither you or I are CPAs and we're not giving tax advice, but the real estate professional status can be a game changer for folks that are able to show that they're acting in real estate related activities for X amount of hours throughout the year. And then that allows passive losses to offset active income, which is really that unicorn that everybody in this space is searching for. And I got to, to take advantage of that um, by leaving the W-2 and getting rep status uh, when, when allowed. So that's important to note as well. Yeah, reps, which is the way most people refer to it, but that real estate professional status, it is the holy grail that a lot of people seek because that's when you really get to take advantage of the tax benefits. Like for me, I have not been able to qualify because my wife and I have both been working or even when she was not working full-time, it's because we're raising kids and we haven't been able to qualify. Sure. So we actually have a lot of suspended losses due to depreciation. Uh, even though we're cash flow positive on all our rentals, we have these losses. Yep. We can't actually do anything with it. And uh, yeah, if you're able to, we own eight rentals. So in theory, if I wasn't working my W-2 job, I would be able to qualify based on the amount of work I put in. Just to illustrate the example a little more though, if somebody, let's say, my wife and I, we own our eight rentals. We're happy with that. We don't want to grow it to 30 single family rentals, uh, but we do want to become reps and then start taking all these tax advantages. Is it a common situation that you see where people, they turn to passive investing to try and create those taxable losses and, and really offset any other active income? Yeah. So I, I, there's a number of different strategies that you can pursue, but certainly if you have uh, it, if you've got a real estate portfolio and you can claim rep status, there there is a lot of benefit to passively investing. So you can get additional passive losses to apply to the, offset those active gains. Um, but there there are other strategies as well where even a dual income household, there are two strategies where you can still have your passive losses offset your active income, and that is by owning and managing a short term rental is one of those options. And then investing passively uh, with oil and gas. And there, there are s specifics that you definitely need to talk to a CPA if you're trying to pursue those strategies. But those can both be options that allow you to apply those passive losses that are chasing you from year to your active income, which can be really powerful. And I, so when I left the W-2, I was in a similar situation. I had invested for years. Passively, I had this huge wave of passive losses chases me. I had very large income at the first half of the year, and then I sold all of these houses for capital gains, but all of those passive losses offset the W-2 and the capital gains, and I ended up paying less than 4% in federal taxes that year. So it was, it was, it was a, a very good year from, the, from a tax standpoint. So, Yeah, there's some powerful stuff you can do, and this is a broader illustration of if you have a strategy around how you invest in real estate, not just let me put 25 grand here, 50 grand here. If you start to think of it in the big picture with your other income streams, if you're married, can one spouse potentially qualify for this? There's so yep. many things you can do. And, and I can see how passive investing would be a big part of that. 
So I want to ask about now, like looking at the actual, the deals and the operators. So when you, so we talked about how kind of the only real responsibility that a passive investor needs to have is on that front of doing their research, understanding and trusting the deal and understanding and trusting the operator. So how would you advise someone who doesn't have a lot of domain knowledge in this space? Let's just use multifamily, large multifamily as an example. Sure. How would you advise them to figure out how to do due diligence on an asset that they might not otherwise understand? Yeah, so there's a couple of different paths that you can go here. Certainly the education route, I think is probably the best route. And you can get educated by listening to podcasts, reading books. There's great books, all kinds of great books and podcasts out there where you can get really educated over time. I also encourage folks to join investing communities to find folks that are already investing. And the best investment opportunity is one that you're referred to from somebody who has been investing with them for years and has firsthand experience. And not just asking the operator for a referral because any operator in the world is going to give you free buddies that are going to promise to say only good things about them. I don't even waste my time asking for referrals because I know uh, they're going to control which ones they're going to put in front of you. Get around a network, get educated from books and podcasts. And then I think also finding somebody that is an expert that you get to know and trust, I think can be just as powerful as, as those as well. But then you also need to do your due diligence on that operator as well. And at the end of the day, there's no short path to understanding this. And as an investor, I encourage you to just become as educated as possibly can. Invest small at first and diversify because all of the book reading and podcast reading and referrals will take you to a certain level of education. And once you put your first dollars in a deal, That'll take you to an entirely different level. And a lot of people come in and they want to move a lot of capital into the space quickly. And I will even turn people away because I think we're doing a disservice to people. If we take all of their capital and put it into deals, one or two deals right away, I think it's better to put some dollars in, wait three to six months, and then place your dollars into another deal. So if you're in a situation where you got to place a bunch of capital quickly, then... I, I would just say education. And there is no shortage of information and education available, but I'm going to play devil's advocate a little bit here. I'm getting yeah. into passive investing so that I don't have to do all that stuff. So what? So why should I spend hours every week listening to podcasts if I'm just going to put money in the hands of someone who is a professional? It's a good question. And I'm sharing from firsthand experience. I had the... Um, experience with the turnkey operator. I had my challenges there. I had my Burr strategy stuff. I had my challenges there. They invested in the first couple of passive investments. I am now actually have pause distributions on both of those first ones that I have invested in. And I'm potentially getting a capital call from one of those as well. And I went with very large operators that I thought were too big to fail. And I assumed because they had a large brand that they would pay as agreed and there would be no challenges. But we all know what happened in the market over the last couple of years. And both of those first two investments are not going as planned. When you hear the term passive investing, it doesn't mean blindly place capital with anybody you run into at a conference. You have to do your due diligence. And you can very simply go to Google and say, give me a hundred questions to ask uh, a multifamily operator before I invest with them. And that will do a pretty good job of giving you questions to ask that over time, you will be able to get a feel for the quality of person that you're dealing with. So might not be the answer that you're looking for, but I think that's an honest answer for sure. It totally is the answer I was looking for. And again, I was just playing devil's advocate. Ad I agree with that. And then I, I guess the only thought I'll add is that we, as across America, people constantly put money into stocks where they have no true idea how the business operates or what the growth yes, engines are. So it's interesting the kind of differences, right? I agree yeah. with you that I would rather study and learn and, and understand the business model behind a 300 unit apartment complex or a self-storage facility or whatever it may be before I place yeah. my money in it. But I guess there's that interesting like difference with the way people treat the stock market versus some of these private investments.
Yep. But no, I appreciate that discussion. That's an important well, they, nuance. Go ahead. Yeah, I think too, like the due diligence process itself does not have to be extremely complicated. I mentioned the top 100 questions to ask, but just basically looking at the assumptions that are going into the underwriting, if you just, if all you do is dig into those assumptions alone and ask questions and understand what, what is going on there, that's 80% of the risk that you have. So if they're doing a value add strategy, but they're putting fixed rate debt on it, I would ask some questions about that, right? If it's a stable property and they're putting a floating rate with a fixed rate cap on it, I would ask some questions about that. If they're thinking that they're going to have 5% increases in rents, but only 3% increases in expenses, what makes you think that you're going to miraculously be able to do those types of things? So just simple questions like that will give you a good idea into the mindset of the operator. And then of course, dealing with operators that have done what they said that they're going to do over and over and over and over again successfully, like that's a very good indication of what they're going to be able to do in the future. Of course, it's not a guarantee, but if they've done this business model 25 other times and they've exited 20, odds are pretty good that they're going to be able to duplicate those results. So using your own kind of story though, so you mentioned that the first two passive deals you invested in were with big names who were very publicly present and presumably had some sort of reputation for being successful. So how do you mm -hmm. spot the big names that are, they have longevity, they're there and operating, but maybe they've made mistakes or in your case, maybe it was just bad luck or bad timing, but like clearly something didn't go to plan on those two investments you mentioned versus yep. other operators. Like I know that you now have partnerships, very close partnerships with some operators that you really do trust and you would probably vouch for up and down compared to these Absolutely. initial two. So what is the biggest distinction and how would the untrained eye see that? Yeah, I think early on, I bought into the large marketing groups, like they, they have very large brands that were supported by a lot of dollars and folks that seemed like generally good folks or good guys that probably got in over their head and they grew too quickly. And when you have people that have uh, very large followings that are starting to step into areas where uh, they might not have experience, I think that is a red flag for potential problems that are coming up in the future. Just because somebody has a big following on Instagram or Facebook or some podcast doesn't necessarily mean that they know what they're doing in the business that they're in. Everybody's got a story and a path and a plan and everybody learns lessons along those. But yeah, I, I, I'm shifting more towards boring, cookie cutter, very, very similar business models. And I'm leaning more and more on people's track record than I have in the past. And I used to argue very heavily that people, if they have a, a very good track record in one industry that's translatable into other industries, and I think to a certain extent that's true, but success at a very high level um, is a very different beast. And it comes down to running and operating large successful organizations, not necessarily what you've been able to, to own and manage yourself. Because once you get to the size that most of the operators are that I work with today, it really comes down to leadership and growing a sustainable and scalable business that's going to be able to weather the storms so that are inevitably going to be in, in the future. It is a very complex business, right? Some of these plans are pretty, are very specific. And yeah, maybe they'll have one or two, like they'll have a plan B or a plan C, but these things are not easy to pull off and they happen over a very long time horizon. I mean, if you look yep. at the last four years, there's been no shortage of change, including a you know, pandemic and interest rates going crazy, ton of inflation. And so if you bought a deal, you know, if you invested in a deal in January of 2020 and they had a five-year plan, chances are this operator had to pivot several times over and maybe go to plan C or revise and make create a plan D. And so you've got to think about it in the terms of would I trust this person to be able to adapt to big change, even if their initial plans don't play out too. Because I think I listened to one of your podcast episodes, Randy hosts a podcast, which we're going to let him plug uh, here in a minute, but, but you had, you were interviewing the three, I think, main operators you work with. 
and they were sharing about their plans, right? And, and they really stick to a specific plan that they know they can execute over and over again. And then they believe if I heard correctly, they usually have multiple exit plans as contingencies. And there is something to be said for just like becoming the master of a very specific playbook such that you can rise above versus trying to do 10 different things on 10 different deals. And sure. So I, yeah, I think the trust you're able to develop with them, that I'm sure over time only gets stronger so long as they're transparent with you. And if in the event that something bad does happen or something unexpected does happen, I'm assuming the main things you look for are just good communication and the ability to deliver the message to the investor of what are we going to do about it? Is that about right? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, no, I've heard recently, like bad news needs to be shared quickly and promptly. It, it doesn't travel. It needs to be, it needs to be shared immediately. And I think you see in operators when they start to get in trouble, communication will start to lag. It'll be coming longer between periods of communication. And I will, I want the operator that's going to tell me the good and the bad and the ugly as soon as it happens. And at the end of the day, we're passive investors, so we can't pull our money back out anyways, but optically. I would rather hear about it and know what's going on versus uh, looking at it from the rearview mirror. So I have shared before that I personally would rather take lower returns with better communication than better returns with bad communication. And I don't know if that's just because I'm a control freak and I want to know what's going on. Like that's truly how I feel. I would rather take two to three point hit on IRR and know what's going on with the business good and bad for sure. Yeah. If you're in this long enough, eventually something will happen that is not according to the plan. And during that turbulent time, usually something broader is happening too, right? And you're already uncomfortable. You're already worried. The more people can put your mind at ease that at least they're doing something about it or taking control of the situation to the best of their ability, it boils down to why you're doing passive investments in the first place. So you can sleep it. If you wanted right. to be up agonizing over what would happen to your rentals, you would just own your rentals. Right. 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 So, so I want to learn, I, I'm conscious of time. I know we have about probably 10 minutes left, but I want to elaborate on what your specific role is. So you're a capital raiser, which means as I understand it, you team up with operators who need to raise a certain amount of money. You do your kind of own due diligence to understand the operator, understand the deal. And then you have a network of investors who express interest in placing money and you play that matchmaker role. I understand the role at a high level and, and what did I miss? Yeah, I would say you, you nailed it. You captured that entirely is that my expertise lies in due diligence on operators and deals. And I leverage those skills to find the best deals out there. And then I share them with my network. And by sharing those with my network, I am able to bring multiple investors to that specific deal and operator in a much larger check amount than what we would be able to get if we were bringing them independently. And I'm able to get better terms for both myself and my investors because of the size of the check. And we're seeing this trend where operators are starting to rely more heavily on fund managers, which I'm a fund manager or fund to fund. You'll hear that term for a while, quite a bit. Um, because they have reached a point where they've exhausted their network and marketing capabilities. And they are now starting to leverage the marketing and networks of folks like myself. It really benefits everybody. It benefits the operator because they're getting bigger checks. And it benefits the investor because they're getting access to deals they wouldn't get. And they're certainly getting to leverage my expertise or other fund manager expertise in bringing them only the best deals. There's an element of trust, right? As one of your investors, as I get to know you better and I understand the way you think and the, and listening to your podcasts and getting your investor updates, I start to understand how you perceive the risk of a specific deal. Therefore, when a brand new operator comes into your sphere, it's not as if it's coming completely out of left field and looking at it from scratch. I'm looking yeah. at it through the lens of, hey, Randy, the person who I you know built this relationship with, who I've already trusted with my money and he's been able to deliver he believes this is another deal worth looking at. Right? So I think there's yep. some value there in efficiency from the investor's standpoint. But I would also mm -hmm. say it seems like a lot of responsibility for you, right? I mean, I know it's how you earn. It's ultimately how you earn your money is by sure. being good at, at making those judgment calls. 
But does that, you got people investing, I think I saw $7.2 million so far, something like that. Is that the right number? Yeah, seven and a half as of today. So yeah, yes, 7.5 million. So that's not chump change. You've got other people's money out there working, invested. It's taking risk. It's making money and reward for that risk. But is that a stressful thing for you? Or have you, how do you manage uh, the emotions around that? Yeah, that, and that's a really good question. And it's one that I, I don't take lightly. I, I probably have more sleepless nights now than I ever did in my career in corporate America, honestly. Just simple things like getting K, K1s out on time, like that weighs so heavily on me. When I think about if you have a single mom of two that's waiting for her $5,000 IRS return, and she's not able to get that because K1s might be late, like that weighs on me very heavily. So yes, yeah, so I don't take it lightly. Um, I consider that very heavily. I actually have been known to turn away investors uh, in the last, more so in the last six to nine months, just simply because I don't think that this is right for everybody. I think it is, it is right for folks that are sophisticated, certainly. And I, and I will share that just because somebody is accredited does not mean that they are sophisticated as well. Um, so I think it's important that these type of opportunities match the needs and that investors that are playing in the space have a certain risk tolerance that might be a little bit different than investing in the stock market. At the stock market, you can ask for your money back and have it the next morning. If you're with any of the, the large firms, that just simply is not the case. And if emergencies come up, there's no way to get the money back on these until we go full cycle. And a lot of times I've beat that drop, but this is not for everybody, but for those where it fits, it can be extremely powerful. I'll just finish with that. Yeah. At the end of the day, you are putting money into what is essentially a partnership in which you have zero operational control and you're locking up your money for a, a usually a minimum three-year time horizon, probably potentially longer. And the manner in which it will be returned to you and how much will be returned to you is unclear until that time passes. So there's, there's yeah. some gravity that comes with that agreed, like some increased risk tolerance and, and ultimately too, you, know, you just, you got to be you have to cede control, which is something that doesn't come naturally for most people. <laughs> but in your mind, from what I understand, based on your story, that's a benefit, not a consequence, right? You give up the control for the ability to get your time back. You still yep. get comparable, if not even potentially better returns. And you can cycle that money for as long as you want if you found yourself the right fund or her operator. Um, yep. I slowly am selling myself on the idea the more I talk to you. It's funny, but I'm a big believer in the single family rentals and we built a portfolio. We have eight right now and it's very powerful what it's doing and how it's compounding for us. But as a W2 professional, my wife works, we have our kids. There is a finite amount of time. I can totally yeah. see the appeal as we continue to save up chunks of money of just putting it to work in investments like this. And I think it's really valuable what you've been able to share with this audience and hopefully it gave them something new to think about if they haven't already thought of. So why don't we let them know where they can find you, plug the podcast, how can they learn more about what you do and get in touch with you? Yeah, absolutely. So easiest way to find me is on LinkedIn. I'm on LinkedIn all day, every day, and that's probably the easiest. So Randy Smith. Uh, also, my website is impactequity.net and the podcast is The Gentle Art of Crushing It. And I do an edition on Thursdays, which is geared towards the newer passive investor. And then finally, we did just launch a capital raising coaching program as well. So we're doing some one-on-one -on -one coaching for that now too. That is so cool. And yeah, as a uh, consumer of the podcast and also an investor, I can say it's been a great experience working with Randy. And I appreciate you taking some time to come on the show. Any final words for our audience here? I'll finish it the same way that I do on our podcast. And I encourage folks to continue their education journey on passive investing or active investing. But probably more important than that, just make a decision to take some action and either invest in that first active deal or invest in that first passing deal, because that's when the true education really starts. I love it. And uh, a firm believer in that philosophy as well. So. Thanks again for coming on, Randy. We will catch you next time. Thanks so much.